Hey guys, it's Alec Torelli. Welcome back to an episode of The Hand of the Day. Hand of the Day. This one comes from Gareth, who's part of our Conscious Poker Elite Mastermind program. It was a program we ran with 20 people from around the world, and I'm grateful that he shared this hand with us. It's an awesome hand. In this video, I'm really gonna try and talk about how to play poker versus maniacs, bad players, fish, and things like that, because I know it's a spot that a lot of people face in small mid-stakes cash games where you're up against an opponent, he does something random, and you really don't know what to do. So this is a good example of that. We're playing $1, $1, $2 with a $4 straddle, so it's already a live poker game. Gareth finds himself in the hijack, and he opts to raise to $15 here. I think 15 is fine because the straddle is short stacked. The straddle has $130 left. If the, if the stacks were deeper and everyone was deeper, I'd probably go as big as $20 here in a small stakes live cash game just to apply a little bit more pressure. There's a lot of dead money in the pot. We have a good hand. We want to narrow the playing field. We go 15, which is totally fine. And the small blind calls 15. Now, depending on who the small blind is and what we know about them, th this, this could mean uh, a few different things. If they're a really good player, it means they have a probably a pretty solid hand. Not many people are gonna be calling in the small blind when there are four different blinds out of position. They're not gonna be calling with that many hands. So they're either gonna have a really, really strong hand if they're a good player and they think that we are a good player, or it means most likely that they're a little bit too loose, they're playing too many hands, they're probably calling here with more hands than they should, and that's something to take note of. It means this player is probably looser than they should be, and so we should take note of that for future hands. Now, the straddle calls as well, and we go three ways to the flop. Pot's about $50, checks to us in the hijack, or in position rather, and we bet 21, which is less than half the pot. Now, normally I'd be a little bit critical here and I'd wanna see a bigger bet size from the hero in the hand, but I really like this bet size because it shows a deeper understanding of what's happening in the specifics of this hand. You can see here that the straddle has a short stack of $120. So any bet size from us is going to commit the straddle to the hand. So if we bet 50, for example, or 40, closer to the size of the pot, we're not gonna be able to fold to a shove if we bet bigger here. But if we bet smaller, you know, there's a chance that we could be bluffing and there's a chance they can check raise all in and get us to fold. So it gives the illusion that they have fold equity. Now this also does something else for us and it allows us to bluff in a spot like this. If we, if we are gonna bet $21 with all of our hands, we could theoretically be bluffing here because we're not committed to the pot. So when I said before any big bet size commits us to the hand, it's kind of true. We can't really be betting $40 here and be bluffing because our odds are gonna be too good to call it off against the under the gun plus one or the straddles shove. So I really like betting smaller here. It allows us to bluff and it puts the small blind in a really tough spot too. If we bet 21, the small blind can't really get too out of line. They can't like, if they call and then the straddle shoves, they're kind of committed as well. So it puts them in a tough spot because of the short stack, I don't see a reason to bet bigger. Now, if the stacks were deeper and everyone had you know $500, I would like to see a 30, $35 bet size here get value from my hand right away and bet closer relative to the size of the pot. So we go ahead and bet $21, which I love, and the under the gun, or the straddle, now calls. Now this is sort of weird here. I would expect them probably, you know, most of the time to check raise or fold here, given that they only have a one pot size bet left on the turn. But I guess calling's fine too. I could conceivably see them calling with some hands, which I guess if they're just gonna call, which makes sense. Um, but my plan here would be to shove the turn. Right? Anytime I'm in a spot like this, I'm just gonna put it all in on the turn, try and get value from my hand right away. Now the turn comes to five of diamonds and they do something really weird. They bet out one fourth pot, which is $25. Now here in this spot, this is sort of the framework I want you to use to think about spots like these. Your hand, our hand as the hero is way too strong to fold. Right? If, the, if our opponent shoved all in on the turn, we would snap call it off right away because our hand is simply too strong. So the question here becomes, the, the logic here should become something along these lines. We're gonna put all the money in regardless on the river if our opponent shoves. 
So the question is, we're going to go broke whenever our opponent has a better hand than us or outdraws us. The question is, how do we get all the money in in the most efficient way possible to get value from the times that we have him beat or to charge him for draws? And I think when you put yourself in this spot and say, well, I'm going to call all in on the river regardless. So I'm going to lose my money or win or double up regardless. I might as well put it all in on the turn for two reasons. One is we get value from worse hands. If our opponent has something like a nine, we get value right away, a worse queen, etc. The second reason is we get value, and this is the biggest reason, we get value from draws. Draws are probably going to play perfectly on the river against us if we call. They're not going to bluff that often on the river, and if they hit, they're going to go all in. We're going to call anyway. So we might as well force our opponent to put all the money in when he either has a worse hand on the turn, like a nine, or when he has a draw like jack 10, king 10, or a spade draw, we force him to put all the money in on the turn and call it off. Or we force him to fold the turn. If he has a draw, he doesn't want to call it off, but he's folding away his equity, right? He's not realizing his equity for free. He's not getting to see the river card essentially for the cost of his bet. We're forcing him to put in his entire stack. So because you're going to lose your money regardless in the hand, I would like to see the turn be a jam here and apply max pressure on my opponent. That's sort of the framework I like to use in spots like these against crazy opponents when you really don't know what the hell they're up to. We don't know if he has a strong queen. We don't know if he has a nine. We don't know if he has a spade draw. We don't know if he has a jack 10 and he's trying to see a cheap river. It's kind of hard to put him on a hand in this spot. But because we know our hand is too strong to fold and it's worth getting all in, we might as well put it in now. That said, Gareth opts to just call here on the turn and the river comes an ace of diamonds. Now, I remember before I said our opponent's probably not gonna bluff here. This might be one of the cards that he would bluff. If he does have something like king 10, jack 10, or missed spades, he might try and bluff the river and rep an ace here. Even though I understand the better hand readers out there are gonna say, well, Alec, it doesn't really make sense. He can't have that many aces in his range. And I would agree with you. The only aces he could have is something like ace queen or ace x of spades. So he's not repping that much when he shoves the river here, but that said, that doesn't stop a lot of these players from bluffing or attempting to win the pot at all costs. We are getting a great price here. We don't have to be right that often. We're getting three to one, means we have to be right 25% of the time. I would definitely call this off. If he could have something like ace X of spades, he can also have jack 10, king 10, or other missed spades, which means we're gonna have the best hand often enough. When you add it all up, you don't really know where your opponent's at in this spot. Anytime you're getting a great price against a crazy player that you don't really know what they're up to, you generally don't wanna be folding that often. So here I would call it off. If he has me beat, I'd shrug my shoulders and move on to the next hand. That's exactly what Gareth did. He ended up calling it off here. And unfortunately, our opponent turns over ace-king. I think once we see the results, it gives more credence to us jamming on the turn and forcing him to either call it off with ace-king or fold out his equity. That said, as played, Gareth, I really can't blame you for calling the river in this hand. One more quick reminder, if you do want to come out and join me in LA, learn some of my best poker strategy and content, meet some other like-minded players, and take your poker game to the next level, click the link below. You can sign up and someone will get in touch with you to answer any questions you have about the event. Super excited to see you guys there and thank you guys so much for watching the hand of the day. If you like this content, subscribe to my channel. I'd love to hear your thoughts in a comment below. What would you have done? How would you have played this hand? Some advice for my man Gareth and that's all. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time on the hand of the day.